Bradley Onishi, Onishi, I think it's Onishi. Bradley Onishi, mm-hmm. do you know who he is? Yeah. He yeah. hosts the Straight White American Jesus podcast. Uh, he's, he's grew up evangelical, no longer evangelical, has been um, did a lot of really good work explaining the the new apostolic reformation and, and their series on great white, straight, straight, white, jerk, great, white, the straight, white, American Jesus. Their series on the new apostolic reformation is, is worth listening to. But uh, he wrote a piece in Politico magazine somewhat provocative says why Christians and Republicans should reconsider the premise that life begins at conception. Uh, uh, uh. Subtitle, it's not settled Christian theology and it's outliving its political utility. So if you're if you are say if you say life begins at conception because you believe that is eternal and immortal Christian theology, he's saying it's actually not. If you are saying it because you believe it works out for you politically, it no longer does. And I have seen this to a certain extent in the online Christian community because there's a very strong wave of of uh, abortion abolitionists who are saying and the overall pro-life community is not abortion abolitionists. They think there should be some exceptions. The overall pro-life community believes there should be some exceptions. And also they believe that a woman who uh, has an abortion should not be treated like someone who commits murder, should not be prosecuted for homicide. Yes. And so if you're an abortion abolitionist, you're saying, hey, wait a minute. We all agreed that life starts at conception and that taking innocent life is murder. So therefore, even like a day after pill that prevents a fertilized egg from implanting, that's murder and you should be tried for murder. Do we believe that or don't we believe it? And it's caught much of the pro-life community kind of in a bind of saying, yeah, well, yeah, we're not comfortable with that. We're not comfortable with prosecuting women. We're not comfortable with telling a 10 year old that she has to have the pregnancy from a rape. Um, you know, we're not comfortable with these things that on on one level do seem consistent with what you're saying. So we, in fact, are not being very consistent and we don't know what to do now. And we saw this, uh, he talks a lot about the um, Alabama case. Chief Justice Tom Parker's opinion in the, at the Alabama Supreme Court that classified frozen embryos as human persons. Uh, he says in Chief Justice Tom Parker's opinion in the case, which draws on the Bible, Christian manifestos, theologians such as St. Augustine and Thomas Aquinas and the reformer John Calvin, says it's an openly theological document. Parker argues that since life starts at conception, humans are called to implement policies and make decisions that will protect the sanctity of human life. Okay, and he says he's starting with the assumption life starts at conception and that's what Christians have always believed. And then from there, it makes pretty logical sense to say, all right, you got to protect frozen embryos as if they're humans. Sky. Uh, have, I mean, Christianity is kind of old. It's a couple thousand years old now. Yeah, and it if, is. And if it's kind of old. If you want to go back into the Old Testament, you can add time onto that. Yeah. Did, did early Christians understand what conception was scientifically? No. So can you even you? It's the question is it's it's non chronologically accurate. I don't know what the right term is for that, but it's like anachronistic. Anachronistic. There you go. That's oh, right. Good. Anach- it, like the anachronistic uh, camels in Deuteronomy. We, that was a story. Right. Yeah. I, had, okay. I had to go so, to like, John Walton to, to have him unpack to, it. To say Christians have always believed life started at conception when conception as a scientific reality wasn't even known until I don't know when is kind of weird. Yeah. Which the opposite okay. then is sort of anachronistic too, to say Christians haven't always believed this. It's like, well, if this wasn't a concept at the time, exactly. then it wasn't a concept right. they could have believed. Right. So. right. Exactly. <laughs> okay. So I did a little, I did a little digging in. Bradley Onishi does a little, Onishi does a little digging in in this article. I did more digging in because I did just want to take Bradley Onishi's word for it. I don't know him. I don't know him. So I did a little dig. Yeah, thank you. And here's the here's the deal. I think this is an interesting. Well, you will be the judge of whether this is an interesting point. I believe the phrase life begins at conception isn't a response to the secular world 
it's a response to a prior Christian belief. Okay? So I think it's actually like a reforming of Christian belief. So let's go back, shall we, to Aristotle. Okay? Ooh. Aristotle had an opinion about abortion, and he had actually seen aborted fetuses. So he had a very well-formed opinion. Aristotle believed that the formation of a human was complete at around 40 days after gestation. That was his estimate, that you had a formed human at 40. Wait, they were tiny. They had arms and legs. Okay, okay. That's what he okay, believed. So f 40 days after conception is what you mean? Yes. After okay. gestation. That's what... 40 days this. of gestation. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. You are, yes, you Definitely are Definitely 40 days after gestation is a human. That too. Yeah, sorry. Right. Um, <laughs> so I was thinking. So he, now this is where it gets kind of interesting because he believed this applied only to boys. Boys were fully formed at 40 days. Girls, it took 80 days to fully form. What's, Classic. What? That makes no sense. Be, because girls, and this was Aristotle's belief, were malformed boys that females were malformed yeah males that hadn't developed all the way they developed slower so now for aristotle that point the 40 day point for boy, boys and the 80 day point for girls was when they were given eternal souls okay so the idea of ensoulment happening at some point in human development comes from aristotle uh, that then logic you does not make any sense. I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> snagging on that one. What part doesn't just, make sense? Well, okay. If if girls are malformed boys, oh. yeah, and it takes and and it takes girls longer to form. Here's my point. Yeah, boys have bits and pieces girls don't have when they're born. You know what yes. I mean? And that's those bits and pieces didn't fully develop. The other way? That's right. That's but that's my point. But the boys should have, but it takes longer for a boy to develop those bits and pieces that are visible, right? Am I You're right? You have to pick that up with Aristotle. I, I'm sorry. I Aristotle. also I just, feel like, I don't feel like we really need to talk through, was Aristotle no, just, right about girls my being point deformed is, boys? Like, it, it sounds to me like he's saying girls didn't fully develop, and that's why they're girls and not boys. So to but not fully really develop. Longer? Exactly. That's they're just, just well, so they get souls. They get souls yeah. later. They get souls oh. later because they're just And their just souls behind. are different. Right, they're, they're leftover behind. souls. Mm -hmm. So one really interesting point of conversation that we can't dive into today is how much the Western church was influenced by Aristotelian thought, both in terms of the concept of ensoulment and in mm -hmm. terms of the superiority of males over females. That a lot of that was influenced, and you see a lot of that coming up in Augustine. So in the fifth century, Augustine argued uh, that homicide applied only to killing a formed fetus, one that was either 40 days for a boy or 80 days for a girl. So any killing of a fetus before 40 or 80 days wasn't a homicide because the baby wasn't fully formed. Now, this gets interesting because it kind of differed from Jewish thought. And here's where it gets really interesting, because what does the Bible say about abortion? Virtually nothing except for one passage in Exodus. Okay, there's a passage in Exodus where if a man strikes a woman and the woman is pregnant and, and, you know, has the baby or the baby comes out. And it's controversial because it's interpreted two different ways. The Hebrew version of this text, this is how it reads in Hebrew. If a man strives and wounds a pregnant woman so that her fruit be expelled, but no harm befall her, then he shall be fined as her husband shall assess and the matter placed before the judges. But if harm befall her, then you shall give life for life. So that's the Hebrew of that passage. Human life is sacred, but the unborn child does not for these purposes in, in Jewish thought count as a life. Now, the Septuagint, the Greek translation, changed it. Reads one word completely differently. When the Hebrew word asan was translated as harm, the Septuagint reads it as form. So the Greek translation reads, if there be no form yet to the fetus, he shall be fined. But if there be form, you shall give life for life. And that means applying the life for life principle to the fetus rather than to the mother. 
which is why form became so important for early Christians who read the Septuagint, as opposed to Jews who did not, who read the, the Hebrew. Okay, so now Augustine comes along and says, it is homicide only if the fetus is fully formed. He's going off the Septuagint reading of Exodus. In fact, he says this in his, um, his commentary on the book of Exodus. And if it's, you know, so 40 days, so he borrows from Aristotle and then he applies it to the Septuagint. Okay, are you with me? That's interesting. Huh? huh? Okay. So then where do we go for? Lots, yes, Caitlin. Lots of Jewish people were reading the Septuagint too. Yeah. I'm, oh, yes. Okay. Whatever. Sure. <laughs> then you, <laughs> then just, you, just a point of clarification. Well, no. Yeah. Okay. K Kaylin's point was by the time the Greek translation of the Old Testament came along, the Septuagint, there were Jews living throughout the Roman Empire yeah. and many of them read the Greek yes. Torah, which yeah. is the Septuagint. Yes. So this, okay. it wasn't just Christians reading the Greek Old Testament. There were Jews as well. But your point, <laughs> Phil, is the earlier manuscripts, the Hebrew manuscripts, are the original closer they, to the original they text. used it differently they right. translated one word differently and yes. uh the first well the third century jewish scholars were not shaping western civilization as much as the third and fourth century christian scholars so in the fifth century Debatable. augustine argued that homicide applied only to killing a formed fetus uh one of 40 or 80 days gestation the Justinian Code of the 6th century confirmed that fetuses under 40 days did not have souls. Okay, as of the 6th century, that was widely the Christian position. Before 40 days, you don't have a soul. Uh, then we go to 1588. If you're and a Pope, boy. If you're a boy. If you're a boy. 80 days or if you're girl. a girl. Oh, I right. wonder if they okay. change that at any point. I don't know. But in 1588, Pope Sixtus V rejected this view... And issued the papal bull. Uh, issued a papal bull. <laughs> his name, <laughs> papal bull. His, his name yeah. is Sixtus the Fourth. Sixtus no, the Fifth. <laughs> Sixtus, Sixtus the Fifth. The fifth? <laughs> yeah, That's he confusing. Was the, he was the fifth Sixtus. Was, was fifth if the fourth and fourth if the third? No. And third well, if the second? No. <laughs> no. Pope Sixtus the Fifth rejected Augustine's view and issued a papal bull that declared that abortion was murder whatever stage of development the fetus had reached. Okay, so he changes it for the Catholic Church. But three years later, his successor, Gregory the Ninth, rejected that and put it back in the Augustinian way. So he, re he, he canceled uh, the papal bull that said any abortion was murder. That stayed in place until 1869, when Pius IX reinstated Sixtus V's bull and made it, again, homicide at any point in uh, development. And from so then on, long, that has been the how, view of the Catholic Church. How long was it between Gregory IX and Pius IX? Uh, um, 1591 to 1869. So almost 300 years that it returned in the Catholic Church to the Augustinian mm -hmm. view. And that, but since 1869, it has been universal in the Catholic Church that any form of uh, abortion at any time is homicide. Okay, so the Bible doesn't actually say much about this other than the part in Exodus that is hard to interpret, depending on whether you're reading the Septuagint or the original Hebrew sky. I have another question, just okay. for my own. Okay, so since 1869, the Catholic Church has consistently sided with the view that abortion is homicide. Yes. But I could be wrong. I don't recall ever hearing that the Catholic Church advocates for women who've had abortions to be prosecuted for homicide. Is that correct? So different. Things. I'm not aware. Right. Yeah, I'm not aware of that ever being okay. the case. Right. Okay. Got it. So Thank then, you. yeah. So it wasn't until uh, the late 1970s that American evangelicals began embracing the Catholic position. 
And you, there's a lot of writing from the Southern Baptists and other denominations that were supporting limited access to abortion because they took a view that was closer to the Augustinian position. Uh, and it was fairly common even throughout the 19th century in America that there was a different legal status to a fetus after quickening and quickening is about 18 weeks when a mother can feel a baby moving. So because some people had decided that quickening was the moment of ensoulment, that quickening, the baby comes to life when God puts the soul into the baby before there's a soul. And in fact, Thomas Aquinas wrote something where he said that a, that a fetus starts out with the life of a plant and then develops to the kind of life of an animal and then upon ensoulment becomes human. Interesting. Again, going back to Aristotle, if the progression yeah. is from lower form of life to higher form of life, then you would argue if women take longer to gestate yeah. and form, they are actually a higher yeah. form of life you're, than men. You're really, but if you want to argue the other to, way, then they should be ensouled first. Um, okay, but all of this, go. all of this stuff is all built on a non-scientific pre-enlightenment understanding of all of this. Like the argument yes. that a, a, a fetus isn't sold when there's quickening, which is when a mother can feel the baby moving in her. Like that's all just experiential. It's not scientific. We know that now. So yes. what's the point? <laughs> <laughs> what's the point is that, and this is the point Bradley Onishi is making, but I'm also <clears throat> making that the phrase life starts at conception is confusing, number one, because, and I've, I've had this conversation with several people online, the egg and the sperm are both alive. There's, there's, it's not dead things mm -hmm. coming to life. So just the, the mm. way it's phrased is misleading. A more accurate phrasing would be um, the development of a new human person begins at conception. A process okay. is beginning at conception. Whether you say that process is a person, because this leads uh, to some tricky questions, like can a single cell be considered a person? You know, when you have it, when you have, and these are questions that no one was asking in biblical times because no one had any idea right. what was actually right. going on inside a womb. No one had a clue. Um, you know, are, can you say that, what do we grant personhood to? Do we grant personhood to a fertilized egg? Um, on what grounds do we grant personhood to a fertilized egg? Do we grant personhood to, do you need a body to be a person? Because up until the blastocyst stage, there's no body. There's just some cells. There's no body there. Half of the cells in a blastocyst will become the placenta. The other half will differentiate and start to develop into a body. But before that stage, there's no body. If no, I recall from my, knows. From my yes. AP biology class in high school, the blastocyst, so like, okay, fertilized embryo starts multiplying cells and then it, 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 it creates like a sphere of cells. And then yeah. there's... Uh, the beginning of the digestive system occurs when they're it, like indents and, and creates a little hole that eventually pokes through the other end. So then you get you like just a, jumped you just jumped way ahead. Did I jump ahead? What is yeah, that? Yeah, because the sphere the sphere itself, the outside of the sphere, is the placenta. Will be the placenta. Okay. The okay. inside of the sphere will eventually start to develop the embryo. Right, but the beginning of that is the the formation of a of a of a canal through the middle, which becomes your digestive tract, right? And I think Once, in different species, the, the beginning of that indentation that goes all the way through. In some species, it's the mouth, and some species, it's the anus. And I believe in humans, it's the anus. So when we are all starting out, we're all just little a holes. Is my point, which well, I that's think brilliant. is evidence that's just, for that's, sin. Caitlin. Mm -hmm. Caitlin, can I would you add, like to comment? Yeah, well, can I add some some of the history you didn't talk about too? I, oh, yes, I think please. it's also important because because people will talk about this a lot. They'll 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 use even more recent history to say Christians, even even evangelical Christians, have not always been pro life, and they'll go to statements that the Southern Baptist Convention made, groups of evangelicals made prior to Roe v. Wade. And that's important on one hand to say a certain political orientation to this question has not been the universal political orientation of even evangelicals in our country 
Daniel Williams, historian, has written a bunch about this whole period. But what's important to note is that there's a big shift among evangelicals. I mean, you can trace the year that some of this changes in part in relationship to the ability for people to have ultrasounds and see Mm -hmm, unborn children. So that's a huge emotional part of it. But also some of the story of this with evangelicals is not a story of enlightened people who were very open about abortion and then got in league with Republican politicians and became very pro-life. Part of it is there were some powerful men early in evangelicalism that wanted to have a theological account of access to abortion in part because it was men who benefited from women having access to abortions. Like in this in this uh, work that Williams has, he talks through some of the kind of higher up leaders who prior to some of these changes with access that women had to all sorts of reproductive care, wanted access to abortions so that their mistresses wouldn't have a baby and out the relationship that they were having. So it's not an unbroken history of like, we used to be cool about this and then we got uncool about it. It's like, we've always had mixed motives in how we came to the conclusions we came to politically. It sometimes is genuine reflection on scripture. It's also the context that we're in. It's also our own motivations for sometimes really evil reasons. And so the history on that, I just want to say, is not it's not clearly able to be interpreted. I think some people think I can tell an easy story about how Christians have thought about abortion if I tell you some of these historical facts. And, it's, and as Phil has described, it is a complicated story, in part because what we know about what is happening in reproduction has changed so much. And the average person's knowledge, not just doctor's knowledge, but with the advent of the ultrasound, it was I myself can see something that I couldn't see before. All of those mm-hmm, things affect mm-hmm. how people are working through the practical question of what does this emerging – and even though abortion has existed for a very long time, the ability we have now to use certain – means that are safer, that's a a relatively new technology, our ability to discern how we respond to that is changing based on a bunch of different features and conditions and and emphases and biases that we are all swimming in. Right, right. Um, So there are a lot of questions that it's now very hard for evangelicals to discuss because this notion in this this very strict notion, life begins at conception, so any disruption to that development is murder. It's very hard to question that premise, you know. So asking questions like, um, is a fertilized egg a person, or is a fertilized egg a container with all the instructions for the development of a person? You know, can a single cell, like if I take a cell from my cheek, it has my entire genome in it. Is that another fill? It could be developed into another fill with cloning. Is it murder to kill the cell I take from my cheek? No, of course not. Why not? Well, let's see. And then we actually have to wrestle with that. Why is it okay to kill a cell I take from my cheek, but not a cell that, you know, wants to divide and and keep subdividing? Well, because you've started a process. You've started a process of human development. So do you put the personhood in the process? Do you put the personhood in the genome? Where are you putting personhood? And we don't even have that conversation because we We've, we've made it off limits to even talk about it in Christian ethics, Sky. Yeah, but it also raises, let's, gosh, this is the, the big legal question we've had for decades now. If it's the beginning of a process that leads to personhood, where in the process do you cross the line into personhood? And that's what no one's... Exactly. One's, Right. That's the so, hard conversation. The easy conversation is it's not a person until they're born or it's a person from the moment they're conceived. Those are the two easy positions to take. A quickening was a nice middle position where you could say, oh, it's a person when it starts moving. We know now, well, that's crap. That is scientific crap. So, yes. So you are you're either you're taking some position that is somewhat arbitrary. Uh, because there really isn't right. another Un- unless unless you start with the conception argument which is what the catholic church has done since 1869 yeah. which or is the not birth argument which some strains of judaism have done right i don't know too many people and, that are comfortable with the birth argument though uh, yeah no uh well if you believe it's if you believe it's legal it should be acceptable to have an abortion until birth um w.a chriswell one of the most famous pastors in southern baptist history thought it was birth 
where you would grant legal protection well, to a baby I, until uh, Richard Land changed his mind. Right. I mean, the whole the ambiguity in all of this, though, is I can understand the appeal of those who say conception because it takes the ambiguity out. Otherwise, yes. it's it feels arbitrary, like you're saying. So, Caitlin, you're squirming. You want to say something. I just, well, I just think the it's other Kayla's underlying squirming. dynamic in all of this that we don't name very often is that part of the reason that there's been such a push to say life begins at conception or more accurately, as Phil says, a new human person is created at conception is in part because begins I think that developing. We, begins developing. Begins developing. Excuse yes. me. Yeah. I think part of the reason that that's appealing is not just that it's a clear line, but that so much of our advocacy around pro-life questions have been framed and motivated and energized by the idea that the, the most important thing we can do is a life and death thing. And if that's the issue mm -hmm. that's on the table, you can justify nearly anything. I mean, in some far corners of this, you can justify bombing an abortion clinic or persecuting, prosecuting women for murder. Um, it helps us politically to say that this is the most important thing. We talked, we've talked about this a ton when it comes to presidential elections. The most important thing is that you would elect a pro-life person who puts pro-life judges on the Supreme Court because this is life and death. And my frustration with that is not just the way that we've often used abortion as just a trump card against anything else, which we've talked about a lot, but the underlying assumption that for something to be morally and politically important, it has to be about life or death. Instead of saying mm. lots of things really deeply matter that are not just life or death. So to Bradley Onishi's point, I mean, I don't even know that he would say this, but along the same lines of what he's arguing, I actually think it would really benefit pro-life people to talk more about why a country that aborts so many children is not the kind of place that we want to live in, which then does obligate us to talk about the way that we care for women who are pregnant, the way that we care for children that are born in our country, it obviously then wraps us up into all of this other stuff. But for us to say there are deeper spiritual and moral and political reasons that I want less abortions to happen, and it's not just because it's a life or death issue. It reminds me of the IVF conversation when we were talking about part of the opposition, not just Catholic opposition, but some Protestant opposition, there's other good reasons to be opposed to IVF. But one reason that's come up recently is this life begins at conception. And so if you have to create additional embryos to do IVF, you're creating additional human lives that you'll have to kill. Some people in opposition to that have said that's that's utterly ridiculous. They've given examples of, of miscarriages that happen very early, all these other examples of why this isn't a life that should be protected in that same way. The bizarre thing about that to me is that this does not have to be morally equivalent to a born grown person to be something that matters and how we treat it matters. So the fact mm -hmm. that parents were upset that these embryos were destroyed isn't just because they thought this is morally equivalent to my toddler. They said this 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 thing, this matter that's here, this, yes, this clump of cells is more than just the clump of cells off of Phil's face. <laughs> there is something sacred and important happening here. And even if we don't wanna say life begins at conception and so there should be absolute prohibitions against abortion, we should still say, this is morally significant and what we do with this matters. And I just wish that that could be more of our political conversations is saying, I don't have to ratchet this up to the level of this is life or death for me to say this really matters and how this shapes our souls and our human communities deeply matters too. Okay, Caitlin, here's, the problem, with, here's the problem with what you just said. I'm with Caitlin. <sighs> Tell me what you just said what you just said will not fit on a bumper sticker or a tweet <laughs> and therefore it is completely irrelevant to our political conversation yeah Unfortunately. yeah because I, I i've gotten in trouble on twitter for agreeing with billy graham about abortion that and his position was abortion is evil but in some rare cases may be the lesser of two evils yeah um, but isn't that exactly that, the argument everyone makes who supports certain political candidates these days? Yeah, but that's not about life or death, Sky. The only things that matter are things that are about life and death. Um, yeah, but if you if it's this um, absolutist position that is really, I would say, based in response to the former Christian position of life begins at quickening. And we say, no, no, we don't believe that anymore. 
life, but it was really about ensoulment. It wasn't even about life. No one argued, even, even Aquinas said that, you know, at the very earliest stages, that's a life. It's just more like a plant life than an animal life or a human life. So no one has ever said there is no life before yeah. conception uh, or, or before quickening, but we've made that such an a, a easy slogan to pass around and put on things and to kind of inflame passions around that we fail to think through the logic or the implication until you actually overturn Roe v. Wade and someone mm -hmm. tries to ban IVF or, or ban, uh, you know, IUD uh, contraceptive because it can cause uh, a, a, a blastocyst not to implant. And then we say, wait, wait, wait a minute, is that what we really meant? But in that regard, Sky. isn't the overturning of Roe maybe a good thing because it's forcing this conversation? It's forcing both Christians and non-Christians and everyone else in our society to ask, what do I think about this? What do we think about this? I th what, is a, yes. what is a humane and just policy? I mean, that's kind of what overturning Roe was intended to do, is to kickstart the conversation. And it's well, going to be very messy for a very long time. Well, it was kick it back to the states. But right. now others are saying what we really want is national policy that, that outlaws all abortion and some kinds of contraception. So, and, and what I see potentially happening is that this issue that welded the whole religious right together is now splintering parts of the religious right because, you know, no, we're, we're, we're really pro-life and we want to criminalize women and we want to, you know, we want to take it all the way. And others saying, no, 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 we never wanted to do that. Why are you saying we wanted to do that? So I, I find it interesting that yeah. the coalition that was brought together by evangelicals adopting the position of the Catholic Church from 1869 um, may be splintering because like you've said several times because the dog caught the car and now right. says are we do, is that actually what we really believe and it is interesting that the, the the standard bearer for the religious right in the political realm anyway is donald trump and he's running away from this issue he does not want to, to mm -hmm. engage yeah well, they said the recently works. he may support a 15-week ban yeah, but um, he's, he, he's also saying it's a losing, it's a loser issue or a losing issue for the Republicans, and he doesn't want to run on this. Yeah, oh, so, because winning winning means more than having a cohesive ethical code. Okay, right. last thoughts, uh, Caitlin. I really liked what you had to say there. You put thank that you, Phil. together because it should matter. It should matter. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. how we treat, how we think about creating human life should matter. I don't even yes. know why you would have to say that. But um, that's a and good, so there's a, go ahead. Well, that's a, that, but what you just said is a good description of, we have often substituted thoughtful Christian reflection on a host of questions about how we mm -hmm. create life. This is about abortion, it's about IVF. It's about, I mean, not that, I, you know, we necessarily need to adopt Catholic positions on all of this, but we should think about birth control. We should think about how we raise children and under what conditions people have. Like these are all important ethical questions. And we have substituted thoughtful Christian reflection on those questions in our communities with the aid of scripture. Yes, thinking about what that means for policies that affect our whole communities. We have substituted all of that complicated, important, thoughtful work for we're pro-life and that tells us how to vote four times a year. Right. And that's the subtotal, sum total of our thinking about human life. And it should be so much more than that and richer and deeper and more interesting than that. Mm -hmm. I, it feels like we've yeah. substituted really the, pro the difficult process of pursuing wisdom for slogans. Yeah. And that's not just true in this issue, but many others. Oh, so true. Okay. Hey guys, what do you think? Let us know. Did Caitlin get it right? Did Sky get it right? Who's wearing the better hat today? I don't know. Um, I know we have some people in our audience that are, are more liberal than I am on the issue. And I know we have a lot of people in the audience that are more conservative than I am on the issue. So I'm interested to hear your thoughts either way. Do you see um, a do you see cracks in that the tight Jerry Falwell, Paul Weirich? Because Paul Weirich was Catholic, and he was the one who was trying to figure out how to get evangelicals to come along and vote with Catholics as a single block. And his partnership with um, Jerry Falwell made that happen. He was the one who suggested the name uh, Moral Majority, which then Jerry Falwell took and, and ran with. So it's a really interesting history of how Catholics and evangelicals came together because they felt 
uh, America was morally going off the rails. And if they could find common ground between conservative Catholics and conservative evangelicals, conservative Protestants, that they would make up a huge voting block. And it was abortion that became the issue that really brought that block together and adopted the Catholic position. Uh, which is kind of interesting and changed the SBC, changed the writings of a lot of Christian organizations to match the Catholic position. Not, not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying it's interesting and we should talk mm -hmm. about it because it was only the Catholic position since 1869, which is also interesting. And before that, the Catholic position was more influenced by Aristotle than by the Bible. Also interesting. Okay. I'm going to wrap it up now. Uh, let us know what you think. Come to HolyPost.com. Uh, new stuff coming out on Holy Post Plus all the time. Caitlin's getting the show. Esau's getting a show. Sky's got another show called The Sky Pod. Oh, my gosh. We're, we're uh, what are we? We're like a media company. You sounded like Oprah there for a minute. You get a show. You get a show. And you get a show. And I don't need another show right now. I'm I'm kind of busy with some other stuff. Uh, thanks for listening in, and we will see you guys next week. Bye.